I'm Sholene Ma'ani at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. And as a member of the executive board of OSLE, it is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker and our audience uh, to this uh, special invited session of the 2021 OSLE conference uh, hosted uh, in Beijing. Uh, our speaker tonight, Professor Sasha Becker, uh, holds the Chao Kai Yang Chair uh, of Business and Economics at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, he's also uh, associated as a professor with University of Warwick in the UK. Um, looking at uh, the publications of Professor Becker, it boasts a very impressive and long list of, of very interesting papers. Uh, they cover topics uh, which labor economists are, are interested in, uh, and they include a wide range of topics uh, like uh, immigration, entrepreneurship, marriage options. And uh, one of the features of the research uh, is that it often deals with special shocks to the economy and following their impact, such as Brexit uh, and COVID effects. Uh, uh, Sasha's research uh, uses econometrics and modeling with data very effectively with perceptive uh, thought to solve difficult problems. So, so it's our great pleasure uh, to hear the talk tonight. Uh, the topic is related to uh, scholar risk and the effect of networks uh, for immigration of uh, academics. Uh, and the talk will be for about 35 minutes and we'll have some time at the end uh, for questions and answers. Uh, so, so please, we are looking forward. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, so you see the title, I have various co-authors and you see all of us in this photo. And I deliberately picked this one, which shows all of us at the Chinese tower in Munich, Germany. Um, if you ever uh, go there, you should go and visit that place. It has a very nice beer garden. And that's where we had our lunch uh, in the break while working on this paper. But the topic is unfortunately a quite serious one. Um, scholars at risk. Um, even in these days, 2020 and uh, the 21st century, academics have faced persecution in many countries. And there is an association called Scholars at Risk, and we kind of borrowed the name also for the title of our paper, that says that there have been 341 attacks on universities in 58 countries just uh, last year. So academics, are always subject to persecution in various forms, going from uh, free speech issues uh, all the way to attacks to your own life. And maybe the most prominent example of that is the persecution of Jewish academics in Nazi Germany. So talking about academics of Jewish descent, and I should stress this Jewish descent, because what the Nazis were interested in was if you had at least one grandparent who was Jewish, that made you of Jewish descent. So it was not, not just about you being of the Jewish religion in 1933 when the Nazis came to power, but whether any of your grandparents had been Jews. That was the group that was targeted. Now, who were these people in um, Germany, in Nazi Germany? And in physics, it was the likes of Albert Einstein, James Franck, Max Born, um, in mathematics, John von Neumann, the von Neumann we know quite well in economics, Emmy Noether, Richard Courant, who we'll talk about quite a bit in a few minutes, and then in chemistry, the likes of Fritz Haber, Otto Warburg, Georges de Havesy. And I mentioned de Havesy not also because this is not just people who had been in Germany for ages, but it's also academics of Jewish descent from other countries, like Georges de Havesy, who came from Hungary. And it's not just in the sciences where you have these uh, well-known names, but also in philosophy, Theodor Adorno, Hannah Arendt, who then also went on to write about totalitarianism. 
And in arts and music, Evan Panofsky, the world's most prestigious art historian at the time, and Arnold Schoenberg, the composer, who came from Austria. Now, all these people were super well integrated in German society. So not only were many baptized Christians, and it was only the grandparent generation who was Jewish at the time, um, but also those who were still of the Jewish faith, often intermarried with Christians. And all these people who were well settled in German society, at the pinnacle of German society, um, then in 1933, as Hitler rose to power, were told that they had to give up their positions because the Nazis decided early on that all the public sector, including the universities, should get rid of all people of Jewish descent. That meant that one sixth of German academia, all of them Jewish, um, were losing their job early on. And that also in implied that academics of Jewish origin scrambled to escape through emigration because many no longer saw a future on German soil. Now, Germany's loss was other countries' gain. What probably many of you know, but some may not know, is that before World War II, Germany was what the US is arguably today, the leading science nation in the world. Before World War II, it was German universities or academics in Germany who won most of the Nobel Prizes in the same way that today US-based researchers do win these prizes. And this expulsion of Jewish academics from Nazi Germany and many of them going to the US um, solidified the transition of scientific leadership from Germany to the US. Raymond Fostick, the President Rockefeller Foundation at the time said if Hitler had set out with benevolent intent to build up America as the world's great mathematical center, he could hardly have achieved more successfully the result which his ruthlessness has accomplished. During the last decade, 131 leading European mathematicians have migrated to the US. And he also mentions explicitly Göttingen, and we'll see Göttingen quite a bit during this talk. Um, in many places, um, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, the University of Brown, NYU, Harvard, Chicago, Wisconsin, MIT, only had few world-leading mathematicians before um, the Jewish mathematicians from Europe arrived, but also more broadly speaking, across all various academic disciplines, many US, US universities gained from this expulsion of Jewish scientists. But of course, not everyone was a world leading Nobel Prize laureate type person. There were also academics that were less well known and many in fact ended up dying in the Holocaust in Auschwitz and other concentration camps. So trying to understand who got out and how is of utmost importance. And historic accounts suggest that academic networks played a key role in emigration. And to illustrate that, let's talk a little bit about Richard Courant, who back then in 1933 was one of the world's leading mathematicians. So Courant at the time was in Göttingen, and Göttingen at the time was the, by far the best mathematics department in the whole world. And Alone in Göttingen, there were 16 academics of Jewish descent. And this picture only gives you a small extract of the people that uh, Courant was related to. And um, what happened is uh, Courant lost his position in 1933. And uh, what did he do? He went to Cambridge, UK first for one year and then went on to NYU in the US. And this just illustrates some of the colleagues he had in his career and uh, for whom we know explicitly that he helped them get abroad and in some cases find jobs elsewhere. So let me give you some examples here. This is Fritz Jon, um, who also was in Göttingen in 1933, uh, in the same way that Courant was. And Courant writes a reference letter for him and he writes, that he recommends Jon in the strongest possible way. And because he has extraordinary gifts of the receptive kind and combines them with real originality and tenacity. So that's a reference letter that has survived 
to the record so that we still know about it today. He then first also went to Cambridge and then also went to the US, but not to NYU, but instead to Kentucky. And only later in life, he also uh, went to NYU where Courant was. Courant also wrote letters for other people. This is Kurt Friedrichs. And I want you to notice here, if you can see that, if the font is big enough, who was first on German soil, an academic in Aachen. Then he was in Göttingen. That's where he overlapped with Courant. But by 1933, by the time the Nazis rise to power, he has moved on and works in Braunschweig. So he is no longer a current colleague of uh, Courant at the time the Nazis come to power. He is a former colleague, um, but still Courant supports him. He writes a reference letter and again you see a quote here and he also at some point goes to NYU. So this is one way in which someone who goes abroad, and that's a person we call an early emigre, someone who leaves Nazi Germany in 33 or 34, so early on, the first two years after the Nazis come to power, how he might help colleagues who are still left behind in Germany, reference letter writing. We also know in Courant's case, he also shared information. He would also let people on German soil know about opportunities in Germany, not just reference letter writing, and by virtue of living in New York, where many people who would at some point move to the US arrived, he also helped these people by having them over for dinner, talking to them about opportunities in the US. So there are various ways in which an early emigre who had moved abroad and who now has connections to academic networks in UK or the US or somewhere else, if it's a different person, would be a bridge, a bridging node, someone who connects an academic network abroad to the old academic network back in Germany. So what is the idea of this paper? We want to see whether colleagues help, whether professional networks matter. So to illustrate that, this simple example here, network one and two, both of those artificial, um, assuming that there are six colleagues that are related to each other, having been colleagues back in Germany, and then assume that in network one, one person moves abroad early, an early emigre, and the network two, three people move abroad early. Our hypothesis is that if there are more colleagues abroad early on, they are a stronger trigger for those left behind. So network two is a stronger trigger to other people also to move abroad than network one, where only one is an early emigre. That's the hypothesis we want to test. Yeah? Does the professional network, the existence of bridging nodes, early emigres, does that help you to get out? Now, why is it that um, people were dismissed from their jobs in the first place? So the Nazis coming to power end of January 1933, very early on after just nine or ten weeks, issue a law, the so-called law for the restoration of the professional civil service, a clear misnomer that ultimately just means Jews are not reliable, we need to get rid of them to have a reliable um, professional service, um, says that everyone who is not of Aryan descent, and Jews not being of Aryan descent, would mean they would have to be placed in early retirement. But, and that is important for our identification later on, um, there was an exemption clause um, on the insistence of Hindenburg, the president at the time, um, those who had served in World War I in frontline service, who were subject to enemy fire, who put up their life for the German people, could get an exemption and could keep their jobs for long. Or if these people would have um, lost a brother or a father uh, in World War I, that would also qualify. But that exception that gave some people temporary respite was removed in 1935 with the so-called high citizenship law when also these people that had kept their jobs for two and a half years longer lost it because of um, a new ruling. Now, that implies that in terms of dismissal years, um, two-thirds of Jewish academics lost their jobs in 1933. And then the vast majority of the rest is in 35. There is a few cases in other years that are due to court cases, but 
Think of it simply as 33 and 35. That summarizes it pretty well. Now, that made a huge difference. By the way, I have some repercussion. I don't know why that is. Some mic is on, someone else's microphone, WebEx support, Chen Wu one. Um, so then it turns out that among the early dismissals, um, there is an emigration rate of more than 60% who are early emigres. Whereas among the latest missiles, it's only 20%. So in hindsight, now that we know in the hindsight of history that the Nazis then went on to engineer the Holocaust, losing your job early on was a blessing in disguise. It was this shock to you, to your thinking about your career, your future life. And those early dismissed people would get out with a higher probability and that may have saved their lives. Whereas those that kept their jobs for two and a half years longer may have um, put their own lives at risk. Now, we ask is the fact that some of your colleagues, not all of them, some by random rules in the law who lost their job early and hence went abroad early, does that push factor that pushes more of your colleagues abroad early on then act as a stronger trigger for also you who may have been left behind initially to also move abroad. Yeah? And that way we hope to identify the effect of network size on emigration. So putting the instrument into the same picture that D signifies dismissal, early dismissal, and the picture illustrates, well, in this uh, case, in Network 2, there were three early dismissals. Two of them indeed do then also emigrate early. One of the early dismissed people doesn't. And that's the kind of variation we will use to identify the effect of professional networks on own emigration. Of course, you never are the first one to work on a topic. And there is lots of work on networks and economics in general. And this first bullet point has a number of surveys looking at networks overall in economics. What we are more closely related to is family and community networks and migration. Yeah? Not just networks in general, but networks and migration. But it turns out most of the work on net networks and migration is about what networks? Family and community networks. So often papers would do something like there is a shock in Mexico and there is a bad harvest and that in a village in Mexico makes some people consider whether to move to the US or not. And those that go, where do they go? Well, they might go to the place where there is already a lot of Mexicans. Yeah, That's a way in which networks of migration often in literature appears. Work on professional networks is very rare. Now, the paper that is closely related to ours, complementary, looking at different aspects, is Buckler, Maya Sakali Tönig, who look at the Jewish population overall in Nazi Germany, the universe of these people, and also looking at community networks, the people you went to school with from the same place you grew up in, but by while, while having the, the universe of people, it doesn't have the skill level, whereas we have all the universe of all Jewish academics, so we know the skill level, uh, but we will also look at community networks and family networks, as I'll tell you later. This episode is, of course, not a normal period in life. It's not like, say, Indian software developers from Bangalore going to Silicon Valley, but this is a period of extreme stress, the Nazis putting people's life at risk, threatening people. So it's also related to migration under persecution and, of course, some people have looked early on at uh, the effect of losing high-skilled Jews to the host population in Germany and to the population abroad. But what hasn't been done is what happens to these Jewish academics themselves. And that's what our paper is about. So in order to do that, we first need to find out, well, who was it who was fired? And that's not completely trivial because there was no census in 1933 that had a variable that says Jewish descent, yeah? But what the Nazis cared about is Jewish descent. So the family tree and not just what religion you have in 1933. So we had to go through various sources and I won't have the time to go through those, but um, we, we go 
through a year long exercise, multi year exercise, three or four years overall, where we first try to define the roster, who were the people who were dismissed. And then for these people, after we had identified the right sample of people, we collect their biographies and we use multitudes of sources, biographical archives, shipping lists, publication records, patenting records, naturalization records. So just to give you one example of one individual, this particular individual um, took us one full week of work. So eight times or uh, seven times eight hours to just get the biography of one individual. The starting point for this gentleman, uh, Alfred Sklora, was uh, this little snippet up here. That's the only information we had initially. We knew that's a person who lost their job under the Nazis. And this little snippet says the person is born in 1902, which turns out to be wrong. So don't trust any source. Economic historians are always double checking stuff. So then all we know is the person loses a job at the University of Königsberg, is a marine biologist, and in 1935 is in an industrial activity in Palestine. That's all we know. But when did he move to Palestine? What did he do after 1935? All of that remains to be seen. Now, but having a starting point, the information of Palestine, we then screen um, newspapers in Palestine from online archives, offline archives, and so on. So we find in the Palestine Gazette that indeed in 1936, Alfred Sklover is the chairman of the um, Palestine Fishing Company. Then 1938, let's see on the right, um, there is a bomb attack by Arabs attacking Jews in Palestine. And he is one of the victims who just about survives. And that in itself we don't use, but it confirms the fact he is still in Palestine, he's still in Haifa. Then what happens next is a twist of events. He gets a medical approbation. So we infer like a detective that he must have done some medical studies in between. And then in 1947, he stops working for the Palestine Fishing Company. And in a further twist of events, also screening publication records, um, historical journal lists and journal archives, we find that then at some point he is the government uh, fisheries biologist in northern Rhodesia in Africa. Yeah? In that particular publication, we also always screen the paper itself because there is often hidden gems in terms of data. So here we find out that by the time the paper gets printed, he has moved away again from uh, Lusaka and is now in uh, London, which again, then allows us to chase records in the UK. We trace down his uh, naturalization record in the UK in 1952, and then find his death certificate uh, in 1960. And here he is listed as being age 59, which means he can't have been born in 1902, but it must have been 1901. Anyways, that's just one example of the kind of work we had to do for more than 1,400 academics in our sample. A lot of people's life is well documented. The world knows nearly everything about Albert Einstein, but there are hundreds of academics who are not as well known and don't have like 50 page of Wikipedia entry. And that is the kind of work we have to do. Anyways, here's the first real data. That is the real sample of Jewish mathematicians in Nazi Germany. And you see here at the center, the cluster of Jewish mathematicians in Göttingen. White means people who are early emigres. Gray means emigrating later, but before 1945. And black means not emigrating by 1945. And in many cases, that meant death and hence black, like going to a concentration camp. Now, if you had more time, you could stare at this and try to count the number of uh, connections and so on. And you would see that if you have more connections to early emigres, you are yourself also more likely to get out. So among the gray dots, um, the ones that get out are the ones that have more connections. Yeah? But of course, throughout identification looming in, in the air, we are also always worried that Göttingen being the best mathematics department in the world, 
those people may be different. Yeah. So what is our identify, identifying variation? People move. Some people spend five, six, seven years in Göttingen, others only two or three. Some people move in May, some people move in. And depending on how long you spend in a specific department, different people come through the department. So the number of connections every single individual has depends on their own career trajectory and how they move across departments, but also who moves to their department and away from their department. Now, um, looking at, uh, for comparison, at the network for law, you realize, A, there is more um, law people and also more Jewish academics in law. So law is a bigger discipline and there are more arrows between cities, which means more people seem to be moving around than in mathematics. Also that kind of stuff we want to control for. We don't want to measure, oh, more people get out of Germany because they are generally more mobile. Yeah? So we will try to take care of that as well. So I'm just flagging issues that we try to deal with, but you will be interested in understanding the outcomes. Let me tell you, in the Jewish population overall, in Nazi Germany, 50% emigrated, 50% were killed in the Holocaust. That was the reference point. And these numbers that you see now, until some years ago, no one ever had seen because no one had ever collected that data. So what we find is that by 1939, already nearly 80% of Jewish academics have emigrated from Nazi Germany and by 1945 more than 80% have. And even among those who haven't emigrated, quite a large share has died of natural causes, say an academic who's 70 and uh, dies of some illness in 1938 would be a natural death. And the share of people who have been murdered in the Holocaust among Jewish academics is comparatively low. That doesn't make it any uh, better, but at least academics were lucky to um, uh, have got out in larger numbers than the overall Jewish population in Nazi Germany. This picture summarizes the whole data set in one snapshot, yeah? and only also one cross-section. Where are people in 1945? And what you see is 50% um, of all arrows go to the US. So the US was the prime destination where people went. A lot of people go to UK, but also all around the world, China, Shanghai, um, Australia, Melbourne, yeah? Palestine. South America. And then these black dots are concentration camps in Eastern Germany, and that means death, yeah? being killed at the hand of the Nazis. So what do we have? What characteristics? Don't look at the numbers, just what are the variables? We have age, marital status, um, gender, um, number of kids, whether people speak a foreign language, which may help it make it easier to move abroad, whether someone did already work abroad before Hitler comes to power, so has maybe pre-existing networks abroad and all of that. Um, and we have information about people's quality, whether they have published a lot, whether they were well known at the time, not in hindsight today, but in 33. So that's the kind of stuff we use. So what do we uh, estimate? We have regressions where we want to understand who got out by 1939. That's the last possibility 1st of January 39 before World War II breaks out or 45 that's the last uh, 1st of January before World War II ends and our key variable of interest is does the number of early emigrate colleagues act as a trigger for you to get out and all the way through we also control for whether you are yourself an early emigrate because assume I myself emigrate in 34 it is unlikely that I will go back to Germany, even though even that happens. There is a few cases of people who did move abroad. They left hell, but they did return before um, the Holocaust and then lost their lives, unfortunately. Okay, so that's the kind of things uh, we want to study. Now, we are worried about endogeneity and I've talked about that. It could be that people have a bigger network are better academics to begin with, or they have been more mobile and so on and so on. So, and that's why we use, as I already talked about, the number of early dismissed colleagues, which is outside people's control as 
an instrument for the number of early emigrate colleagues someone has. Now, we have two first stages. Why? Because not only is the number of early MHA colleagues endogenous, and we instrumented by the number of early dismissed colleagues, but also my own early emigration status is endogenous to my own early dismissal. And then with two endogenous variables, both instruments go into both first stages. Um, the instruments are super strong. We have no time to go into detail here, but if there are questions, we can. Um, so we have strong first stages, and with those, we can then estimate not just OLS regressions, but also IV regressions. And you will notice right away that OLS and IV coefficients are very similar. So it seems that um, the endogeneity issue is not as severe as you might uh, expect beforehand. That could be the result of us controlling for quite a lot of stuff, not only the variables I talked about, like gender, number of kids, which languages you speak, but also importantly, we control for things like academic rank, assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, year of birth fixed effect. And maybe the most important of all these fixed effects is city by subject fixed effect. So what is that? That says, Mathematicians in Göttingen get their own fixed effect. Medical people in Göttingen get their own fixed effect. Medical people in Berlin get their own fixed effect. Um, and so on and so on. Yeah. So using that, uh, it controls for the employment history of people. And as identifying variation uses the number of your colleagues who come in and out and your own mobility. Okay. All that being said, again, OLS and IV estimates are quite similar, and they are also quite similar when we look at 1945 as the reference here, as opposed to 39, which is the main reference here. We can also control for people's own quality, either by how many people, um, how often you are already in biographic dictionaries, like who is who by 1933, or your publication record, number of publications and so on. And that doesn't change those results. So that is the main finding of the whole paper is, yes, professional networks matter. The number of early emigrate colleagues, the larger that number is, the more likely you are to get out conditional on your own emigration status. Yeah? Now, we then do a sample split, that's column six and seven, where the idea is, okay, let's look separately at the people who are themselves early emigres and the people who are by 1935 still in Germany. And we find that the effect we find is driven by the ones who are still in Germany, whereas those that are abroad, the fraction of those who return is super low. So own early emigration is like an absorbing state in most cases. So it is really that the number of bridging notes, people who are abroad, is a trigger for those who are still left behind in 1935, who are not themselves early emigrants. We are worried that mobility per se is something uh, that predicts early emigration and emigration overall. So assume someone has already been in Munich, Frankfurt, Berlin, Hamburg, so it's a moving type of academic those people may find it easy to say, oh, I lost my job, let's go somewhere else, let's go abroad. So what we do here in this placebo exercise is to say, let's look, uh, let's randomly assign a different discipline to you. So let's keep constant your career trajectory in terms of places you've been to. So a mathematician who was in Göttingen and Berlin, let make, let's make that person an art historian in Göttingen and an art historian in Berlin. And would that network they would have encountered had there been art historians in the same universities predict the same thing? And it turns out, no. Yeah? So it is really something genuine about the network you uh, encounter. And it's not about the universities you have been to. Okay. I have maybe one or two more minutes uh, in order to support this notion of um, bridging nodes. What we would hope to find is that people who go to similar destinations then also attract former colleagues to these destinations. If we only found, oh, academic A goes to Canada and 
as a result of that, someone else goes to Shanghai, that would sound a bit strange. Yeah. So what these regressions here that I'm going to show you are going to do is to say, okay, let's say the biggest market of interest is the Anglo-Saxon countries, UK, US, and then there is the rest of the world. And what you would expect is the more of your colleagues go to UK, US, the more likely you are to go to UK, US, and the less likely you are to go to anywhere else, including Australia, Shanghai, um, and South Africa, whatever it is. Yeah? And that's indeed what we find. So the number of early emigre colleagues to US, UK make it more likely that I go to US, UK and less likely for me to go elsewhere. So this directional effects is something we think is super important. We then want to understand, uh, since we are talking networks, whether there is also maybe decay. So if you are my colleague in 1933 and we both go through the same experience in the same place, maybe that connection is more current and um, stronger than with people that are past colleagues. So what we do here, we split the colleagues up into who are colleagues in 1933 and who are past colleagues and it turns out that the current colleagues are a stronger trigger to go abroad than the colleagues that used to be colleagues some years back we can also for bigger cities at least there are often two universities in berlin is the university of berlin and the technical university of berlin and here we ask do colleagues in the same department in the same university help each other more than people say um, in the neighboring university in the same city who are in the same discipline? And here the difference isn't huge, but still the point estimate points to own department matters a little bit more. Then there may be also disciplinary differences. If you are a scientist, there is a lot of formulas and uh, hard facts in your papers, whereas in the social sciences and humanities, it's more the verbal argument that matters most. And if that is the case, then maybe you need a network more to sell someone abroad in a discipline that's less hard fact based. And that turns out to be the case. Social sciences, humanities networks are stronger than in the natural sciences and medicine. And that is uh, here my last slide. Um, since we show established that professional networks better, you might also ask, well, but there is also other stuff going on. People have families, people have friends, and how about that? So what we do here is we do essentially a horse race. What is the network that has the strongest pull and what we do here is to ask um, family networks. What we do is we go to the list of all Jews who live in Germany in 1933 and the following years who have the same family name and live in the same city. So we look at the other Einsteins. Albert Einstein is the one we may look at, the person of interest. Let's look at the other Einsteins and how many of the other Einsteins are early emigres. And does that also matter for Einstein's own mobility abroad and similarly for all kinds of other names. And then similarly, as a community network, we define people who don't have the same family name. So for Albert Einstein, all other Jewish people who are not Einstein's, those are community networks. And then we throw them in a regression and find that the family networks have roughly a similar sized effect, slightly lower than the professional networks, but similar magnitude and the community networks don't matter at all yeah and then to the extent that some family names are more common einstein is super exceptional whereas a name like my own becker is super common um we then also play around with dropping the most common <coughs> first names uh, last names to see whether that matters so what do we show we show that um, using individual level variation, exogenous variation within department, it's not a shock to the department, it's not a shock to all of Germany, it's a shock to individual colleagues who are your office neighbors who lose their job and you might not. That as a push factor for early emigration and then the resulting trigger of these bridging nodes who are now abroad. And we think that that establishes in this case that professional networks do play a role, at least for high school people. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, uh, I see that we have two questions. Uh, can you see them? So, uh, do you have I wouldn't measure, know where, to be honest. <laughs> do you have a measure of academic quality after immigration? Yeah, so let me talk about that a bit. Uh, so, we have two measures of academic quality, and importantly, both of them are pre 1933. We want to make sure that we are not measuring some superstar who became a superstar after they went to the US. So we want to know what was people's quality before Hitler came to power. And we have two measures. One is how many entries do you have in biographical collections like who is who, who is who, which exists today, also already existed in 1933. So Albert Einstein was listed in multiple editions of who is who, already before 1933. So he was well known. Germans knew him already. So he was famous before 1933. That is one measure that we can measure for everyone. You look at every academic, well known or less, and see is that person listed in one of these biographies. Yeah, And we throw that into one of these tables I showed you. Then for the subset of scientists, um, we also have the web of science. Um, the kind of journal collection of modern times also has a back um, end or historic version where you can trace people's publication before 1933. So there we know literally people's CV. We would know for Einstein the whole list of papers he wrote before 1933. And we can throw that into the regression. And that in itself is also a predictor, so quality matters, but it doesn't change the importance of the professional network. So that's a control variable. Thank you. We have two questions and two minutes left, so it's your choice. Uh, one is about whether you consider co-authorship uh, as a factor, and the other is uh, related to the effect of contemporaneous immigration or immigrants on the decision, the effect of that. So what you was the second one? For one. Uh, so uh, the question is, have you considered the effect of contemporaneous immigrants on the decision? And the other question is about co-authors. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so the co-author one, um, that is something we have uh, looked at because we have information on that. Um, so for the people that are in the sciences, by virtue of having their publication record, we also know co-authorships. And in the appendix, we have a table where we uh, include or exclude co-authors, and that doesn't change things. That doesn't say co-authors don't matter, but it, they don't overturn the finding that the network matters. Yeah. And the other one... Uh... Yeah, the young men also asked uh, again about quality. Oh, yeah. So in theory, yes, that's something that could be done. So, but all of these exercises are a bit heroic um, about how much uh, human knowledge was lost. Of those that died in the Holocaust, you could compute um, what an expectation they might have uh, published um, in the years after 1945 had they survived. Um, but for those that went to the US, many of them, of course, continued to publish. But uh, other people's work, including my own course's work, has looked at the detrimental effects of the expulsion of Jewish scientists on those left behind, like the non-Jewish academics, the uh, um, PhD students, and so on. So th there was definitely a, a loss um, to Germany, for sure whether for the world as a whole, that's a tricky issue because many people went abroad and might have found also good conditions to work and continue to be um, top academics. Yeah. All right, thank you. This brings us to the end of this session. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Becker for a very enjoyable and interesting uh, talk. And uh, please join me. <laughs> thank you. I, I, thank I you so much. Thank you. you. <laughs> but it's for thank all you. of us. Uh, thank you.